uh, voyage between West Africa and the South. And the beautiful thing about watermelon is that it's actually one of the crops that kept slaves alive during that period of time. It's 95% water, 5% sugar. So it was really, really an important crop to, to our country at that point in time. It replaced all canteens. You know, there was no canteens available for our workers out in the field, so they took pieces of watermelon with them and everything like that. Also, the bottom of the watermelon, which we call the rind, you know, that some of us pickle, some of us just disregard, uh, they actually would dry them outside and they would put them in the bottom of their shoes for soap. So, so it actually became a big, wonderful crop uh, for us at that time. The second crop is peanuts. You know, now peanuts are a fascinating thing, especially here in Georgia. Actually, it's called a goober berry or goober pea over in West Africa. And when it came over as well, it was one of those crops that really, really made the voyage and, and really survived well in this climate. The peanuts, you know, used for peanut butter and all that other stuff. Well, George Washington Carver was one of the first pe people to actually use peanuts as biofuel. That's what, you know, if you look at the carburetor at the point in time when Model T was making all those wonderful cars, and he wanted to use other things besides oil, George Washington Carver said, hey, use the peanut for biofuel, and you'll actually get more gas mileage. And then they realized that, you know, oil was more uh, lucrative or for them at that point in time, and that's the reason why we have oil and not peanuts is actually the, the use for uh, gasoline in our country. The thing now, it's funny now, it's corn, but actually, you know, it's peanuts at that time. The third crop, which there are some outside, that really, really came across the woods really, really well was okra. You know, now everyone heard of gumbo, I'm sure, right? Well, gumbo is actually the West African word for okra. That's where it came from. So gumbo is a thickening agent. It's not just slimy and everything like that, you know. It tastes really, really good. I love it pickle and, and things like that. But okra was one of those crops that actually, when it grew, it, it had a lot of different uses. You know, if you ever uh, grew okra, uh, the stalks and everything are very, very strong, so they use them for a lot of different purposes, you know, belts and things like that. And it has a thickening agent, of course, we already talked about that. But actually, the seeds of, of okra, you know, for babies, they will use them as seeding uh, agents. You know, they would soak them and everything, they would get, you know, uh, blossom and everything, and they would just put them on a uh, baby's gum and everything to help them so they you know, move their mouths and everything like that. So it has this big, wonderful, wonderful piece. And then the final crop I'll talk about today is yams. Now yams and sweet potatoes are two different things. Right? And sweet potatoes came from Peru, you know, with Okinawa sweet potatoes and things like that that came up through South America. Yams actually come from West Africa. Ninety-five percent of the world's crops of yams is from West Africa. So every time you eat a yam, you're actually eating a piece of history that grew many, many, many years ago. Yams actually started in Mesopotamia and Egypt about 5,000 BC, and they migrated down through the Atlantic Ocean all the way down to West Africa. It's one of the only crops in the world today that you can find in the archives of the Egyptian museums and in pyramids. The only other one you can really find is honey and wheat. The yams is one of the essential crops that you actually have seen, you know, through the pyramids and stuff like that. It's a beautiful, beautiful item. It's best roasted, you know, really good smoked, you know. doesn't do well boiled because it's also 65% water. So you're actually cooking it in its own that doesn't make sense. Lift it up, you know, something like that. I say all this to say, so how did that influence southern foods and southern things like that? Well, a lot of those methods that were used during the time of slavery are actually preservation methods that we still use today. I'll give you a great example. We put small pots or small pieces of smoked meat into greens and things like that. Well, in doing so, the fat rises to the top after it cools down. And you have this big layer of fat, you know, that covers the greens that are inside. Well, that actually was the actual preservation method that they used during that time to preserve the greens which were down at the bottom. The fat, you know, really has a lot of flavor. However, all the greens and all the nutrients were down at the bottom. So you had no refrigeration. It was 90 degrees. You know, in September, it's still 85 degrees. Here. How did you preserve those greens that you cooked the day before? Put a piece of meat in there, not only for flavor, but actually for the fat to, to, to just... If you look at things like pate and 
stuff like that. We actually use the fat or how we use aspic or gelatin, which is still rendered fat, you know, to, to cover to protect the meat in the bottom. That's the same thing that we did at that point in time, you know, in the country. The next one is a, really a precursor to actually creating the greens. It's actually salting of meat. Salting of meats is actually something that we brought over from West Africa and all the way up around and now. And sometimes we look at East Africa, especially when you start talking about things like sushi and stuff like that, where we used to salt the rice and salt the vinegars and everything like that to preserve the fish. You look at how, in, in doing so, the salting of meats is a preservation method that they use to get the meats from this side of the country all the way to the other side. You find it also from Morocco and more Moorish countries, how they salt meats for a little bit more spice, kind of peppers and things like that. But typically those things are not really from West Africa. We really didn't get to the spices until we actually went to this. And the third thing is the amount of sugar that we use in food is actually also a thing that really concentrates to the West African culture. There's a lot of things that we use as preservation methods, and sugar was one of the preservation. The most important crop in this country that we use is sorghum. Sorghum up there, and you know, in the Appalachian region and everything, we actually use the sugar from that to preserve it. The first known pancake in this country was actually found in slave ports because you had the whole cake, you know, which is shown here. So you have the whole here, you have your meal, you cook it out in the sun and everything, and you want to sweeten it or bring moisture back, you use the sorghum syrup to do so. So one of the first known pancakes was actually found in slave ports where they had the whole cake and they actually poured the sorghum syrup right on top of it. Also, good whiskey ultimately came from sorghum as well. You know, before we started adding corn and things to it, great whiskey, you know, really came from that. When you fermented the sugar and you had to dilute it, the next thing you know, you have this wonderful, wonderful cocktail uh, of sorghum. The other thing that is really fascinating about southern food and, and, and that influx from, from West Africa is, is the family setting that really came about it. We had the, the house over here and you had the long parochial tables at that point in time and dad sat on that end and mom sat on this end and kids sat somewhere in the middle, you know, and the table was so long and there was a distance, you know, away from, from, from each other and everyone could segregate themselves, you know, and be in their own world. Well, in these quarters like this, everyone sat together. Everyone sat together. You know, everyone ate together. So the family structure, really when it came to slave culture and slave food and southern food, is it, really, really, you know, directly uh, influenced by how we all sat down and eat, and eat together and things like that. If you go to North Carolina, where a lot of my family is from, we migrated from North Carolina to the Appalachians to Chicago, and then most of my family has returned back to the South, into the Little Rock in Atlanta. You will find how our family life really changed from the point in time when we started eating at the table until we got to the North, where my grandmother's dining room table was the longest room. And that's what I mean for, for what purpose, I don't, I don't know. But those are the things that really, really are centered around Southern culture. A couple of things we talked about earlier that people were asking me, and, and I really want to talk about one thing that in particular that, that people really contribute to African culture or African American culture, and it's not necessarily really true. The number one thing that people think is ours is fried chicken. And, and I can tell you honestly that fried chicken is not, it's not a typical African or African American item. It's actually Native American and more so Scandinavian. If you look at the Native Americans when they would save all their fair oil and things like that and the formula they would use, and you research those expeditions, when you look at that expedition in whole, they used fried chicken as actually for more rabbit at that time. They really had no chicken. But they use that as their meat source to go across the country. Because if you fry it, right, and then you peel back the skin, which is the best part, you know, for us to eat, you know, but you peel back the skin, all the meat's down below. So they would peel back the skin, disregard the skin, give it to whatever animal they have to eat the meat. But that's typically not African American. We, we had influence in it after we learned how to do so. And I say influence in it, you see more now of where the spice market and the spice route came in from the Moorish country and, you know, from West Africa. Things like black peppercorns, cayenne pepper, the gumbo filets that were ground actually as a thickening agent for it. That's why.
a lot of stuff, you know, in 10 minutes, but <laughs> I hope I covered the basis of it. Any questions? Well, I got any questions. Come in. Yes, ma'am. The, the idea of using salt on watermelon, where does that come from? Uh, Do you have any idea how that came about or why sure, people sure. do that? Sure, most, sure. Most, 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 most definitely. Uh, and, and not only watermelon, cantaloupe, you know, which is really uh, centered here. Uh, one thing they were trying to do is actually preserve the moisture in the watermelon. Because if you cut it, the water goes everywhere, you know. So if you salt something, you're actually are helping the molecules on the outside form the skin to keep the water on the inside. So like if you brine chickens or anything like that, you put it in a salt water solution, the molecules actually expand and keep the water on the inside. So they actually they were not trying to disregard the watermelon, they were actually trying to preserve it. And usually during the last part of the end of the season of watermelon, they were trying to preserve it as long as they could. So that's really where it came. Thank you. Yeah, my question. Any other questions? Uh -oh. Uh -oh.